All right. So the first half of this class has focused mostly on uh, data layouts and uh, asking questions about data. Uh, we've looked at what it means uh, for a question to be correct. Uh, we've looked at what it means for uh, two different questions to be equivalent. Now we're going to take a, a step back and look at how a similar uh, set of ideas uh, can be applied to a in a different context, uh, namely changing data. So when we make changes to a data set, how do we make sure that those changes occur safely, uh, correctly, and don't mess up our data uh, for whatever, whatever we mean by that? Um, so, before even getting into uh, into the idea of, of changing data, let's first uh, think about what it means uh, for a change to be correct. What, what does it mean for um, data in general to be correct? Um, so far, we've looked at this. Uh, th this is basically the same thing that uh, we've looked at early on. Uh, We've looked at what uh, correct data is in terms of constraints. We've looked at what uh, uh, query correctness is uh, by having this idea that two plans are equivalent if you can re rewrite one into another. Uh, and like I said, what we're going to focus on today is uh, the correctness of uh, changes to your data. So um, what basic Let's look at this from a, a, the, the, the opposite perspective. Um, not uh, and trying to find correctness by uh, essentially looking at what could possibly go wrong. So, in general, we're going to be looking at a couple of different things that could possibly go wrong. Uh, so, if you have two different uh, processes or two different users, uh, two different components of the system trying to modify data at the same time you want to be able to allow them to modify data in parallel. And if they're both modifying data in parallel, it's possible that one of them might make a change that might make the other one uh, a change that another one's working on uh, incorrect. Uh, there's the notion of uh, persistence. So if you're saving data to persistent storage like a disk, you usually have multiple copies of that data. One copy that's on disk, one copy that's in memory. and you want to make sure that when you change a copy, uh, change the copy that's sitting in memory, uh, that change gets reflected back on disk. And when that change gets reflected on disk, there's a couple of different uh, ways that you can ensure, uh, a couple of different things that could go wrong, uh, many of which are actually quite similar to parallelism, uh, problems that could happen with parallelism. Um, if Let's say I'm uh, doing a bank transfer from uh, one account to another. This is a common uh, example for parallelism. Then I want to make sure that uh, when I decrease uh, both people's, uh, sorry, one person's account and increase the other person's account, that I'm not uh, kind of allow. Uh, if I'm doing two simultaneous bank transfers. I want to make sure that if I, if I decrease both people's uh, bank accounts, I'm increasing the other uh, account by a corresponding amount. Uh, in the case of persistence, if I decrease one person's bank account, save that to disk, increase the other person's bank account, uh, but my system crashes before I can save that increased account uh, to disk, then basically that money has vanished. And I want to make sure that uh, that operations get reflected in, in permanent storage in this kind of safe way. So we're going to talk about, uh, over the course of the next couple of lectures, a couple of techniques that uh, address all of these cases, that uh, make sure that when we put something, uh, that when two, two different entities are modifying uh, data at the same time, or uh, when you're modifying data and then persisting it to disk, uh, we have a couple of different techniques that we're going to use to make sure that these updates get handled uh, correctly. So I keep kind of uh, circling around this issue of what does it mean for uh, a database operation to be correct. Uh, so I'm going to defer that even one further step uh, because before we talk about the 
what it means for an operation to be correct, we need to uh, precisely define what a uh, database operation that could be incorrect is. So let's start with uh, just making uh, precise this idea of updates. Uh, what is an update? Well, SQL defines three operations that you can perform uh, to modify, excuse me, two basic operations that you can use to modify data. Insert and update, uh, as well as delete. Um, we're gonna look mostly at the first two. Um, in addition, you might have uh, you might have outside entities coming in, modifying uh, data in, in various ways as well, uh, without going into SQL. Now, one of the, the kind of uh, difficulties here is uh, thinking about the semantics of these updates. Uh, when you're changing, the, uh, an insert statement changes the data in some precise way, but it changes, it, you want to make sure that it uh, uh, changes uh, data in, in a very precise way, but um, at some level, we don't actually care about what the new semantics of the data are. We just care that some data was, was modified. So let's take a slight, let's take a step back and try uh, to, to um, come up with an abstraction that can handle uh, not just inserts uh, and insert semantics, not just updates and update semantics, not just deletes and delete semantics, uh, and they can still handle uh, the semantics of non-SQL operations. So for this kind of level up of abstraction, uh, what should I call it? Right, so for this, this level of abstraction, uh, we want to have some notion of time. Uh, data is, is changing over the course of, uh, of some sequence of operations. We have some kind of central data object uh, that some sort of uh, database that uh, you can issue operations on. Uh, and we can potentially issue different types of operations. Uh, so we might have some sequence of uh, read operations issued to the database. We ask questions about uh, the object. Um, and we might have some write operations where we actually change the object, uh, excuse me, uh, with that. Uh, you have some read operations going into, uh, into some sort of, of uh, entity that's modifying the, the system, and uh, some write operations that emerge from this entity. Um, now, pretty much uh, over the, the course of, of this operation, eventually the entity is gonna come uh, back to us and say, okay, whatever I just did, I'm happy with it, save it to disk, commit it. This, this the, the state uh, that I've given you, the, the right operations, I want that uh, to be, uh, I want that to be reflected uh, to the rest of the world. Um, or possibly you might wanna have some ability to undo what you just did. So this, this central entity that's performing reads and performing writes is gonna come back to us eventually and say, either uh, abort what I just did, undo everything, uh, or commit it to disk. Now, this is basically the, the database's view of some outside entity or some update operation or some, some sequence of, of events that makes changes to the database. Uh, it, uh, this, this entity uh, receives a bunch of, of information from the database, uh, reads, and it uh, issues uh, commands to change uh, data uh, over the course of its lifetime, and then at the very end, it uh, issues an abort or a commit. And in general, in databases, uh, this is referred to as a transaction. That's all a transaction is. It's a, uh, from the database's perspective, it's a sequence of reads, a sequence of writes, and then eventually either an abort or a commit. Okay, questions so far? Okay, good. So when uh, we, when, let's get back to the original question, uh, what does it mean for a database operation to, to be correct? Um, to be more precise, uh, I'm gonna ask, what does it mean for a transaction to be correct? And remember, a transaction from the database's perspective is just a sequence of reads, 
a sequence of writes, and then eventually either an abort or a commit. Uh, so you might have heard the term ACID, uh, ACID properties, ACID guarantees. Um, so this is a set of four properties that define what it means for a transaction to be correct. So um, the first of these, atomicity, basically says that the uh, transaction either completes entirely or doesn't complete at all. Uh, do or do not, uh, that's when I put it. Um, there is no try. <clears throat> uh, so the, either you do the entire thing or you don't do anything. And from the perspective of the database in the outside world, either the entire transaction completes and commits or there is no trace that the uh, transaction ever happened in the first place. Um, so the, the second thing is consistency. Uh, so we talked a little bit during the data modeling section about uh, constraints and uh, keys and uh, basically some ways to define uh, what we mean by correct data. And so consistency, uh, the property means that uh, all of those uh, all of those constraints that we've defined on uh, the data are correct. Um, unless you're dealing with some sort of crazy time travel, uh, if you have an age field, that age field had never uh, had better never be negative. Uh, account balance, same thing. Uh, you want to make sure that no operation is allowed, to, uh, the, the database will not allow an operation that uh, deletes uh, uh, sorry, that, that sets an account balance to be negative. Um, the third property, isolation, uh, ensures that the data is, that the transactions operations uh, are, um, are completely isolated from every other, uh, from every other um, operation. If you have multiple transactions running at the same time, um, those transactions should uh, get the illusion, at least, that they are the only transaction running in the system. Um, serial programming, uh, this, is, this is something that uh, we've, we've realized for a very long time. It's a lot easier to write serial programs than parallel programs. Um, so from the perspective of the, the transaction, there shouldn't be any other transactions that could possibly uh, mess with its output. Uh, and then the final uh, the final constraint that we'd like to preserve is durability. Um, if you, uh, as soon as the database confirms that a transaction has been committed, that data should be permanent. Um, if uh, it, it should take uh, some sort of massive catastrophe uh, before the uh, the the data. Um, before the effects of that transaction uh, get eliminated. Once the transaction is committed, uh, once the system reports that the transaction has been committed, it should no longer be possible to uh, undo it. Um, now, uh, we're going to look at how to, to address each of these, although I'll note that um, recently there have been uh, observations that at least in some applications, there are reasons not to have uh, all of these constraints. Uh, so isolation is, is one of these uh, constraints that has been uh, under attack. And there are some cases where you actually do want different transactions to be able to interact. Uh, durability is another one. Um, some applications, you don't actually care about durability because if your server crashes, uh, who cares? Um, maybe you're just doing simple analytics. Uh, but overall, we'd like, at the very least, we'd like to be able to, uh, in principle, provide all of these properties. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, durability only applies if the database reports that the transaction has been committed. So as soon as the database says, yes, this is, I, I, I agree that this data will, will stay forever, uh, then unless the server gets eaten by a dinosaur or something, then your, basic, your data should be, uh, should be safe even if the server crashes. <laughs> 
Yep. So then for durability, that also means like where you would get, where you would want that. If you can go to a previous version, then you don't have any of that, or would that still be OK? Ah, OK. So uh, how does this interact with versioning? Um, so dur uh, durability. At the level uh, that I'm talking about right now, uh, there's no notion of versions. Um, basically, the idea is if the database says your data is stable, your data had better be stable. Um, if you, uh, a simple example, uh, there's an operation on uh, most file systems called fsync, which basically says take all of the stuff that's sitting in the memory buffer and flush it to disk. That's basically what this means. As soon as fsync returns, the data had better be on the disk. Um, or if you're trying to provide guarantees for an entire cluster, as soon as fsync returns, the data had better be mirrored across five different servers. Does that address your question? But we, we will get into versioning in either towards the end of today or in the next uh, one or two lectures. All right. So. Um, So consistency, we've kind of addressed already a little bit. We'll come back to that in a couple of lectures. A bit. Um, and durability is uh, something we'll get to in a couple of lectures as well. Uh, today we're going to focus mostly on atomicity and isolation. Um, because those are, at least conceptually, uh, the, the hardest things to, to really uh, implement from a programmer's perspective. Um, so atomist, and both of them fundamentally tr try and do the same thing. Uh, so atomicity, uh, you want to make sure that the uh, entire transaction either uh, is uh, recorded as having committed or is uh, in its entirety uh, not recorded. Um, which means you may basically need some way to kind of group the entire transaction and all of its operations uh, together. Um, similarly, isolation, uh, you want to make sure that the uh, transaction um, is able to, uh, to behave as if it was the only uh, operation in the system. So if I have two transactions, uh, for example, uh, T1 is going to transfer 100 units, uh, $100, from A to B, uh, sorry, from B to A, um, and uh, transaction two is going to increase uh, both accounts uh, by 6% uh, interest, um, then I'd like to make sure that those two transactions execute as if they were the only transactions in the world. Now I've got four operations here. A equals A plus 100, B equals B minus 100, A equals uh, 1.06 times A, B equals 1.06 times B. What could go wrong? Yeah? They're not synchronizing the same value at the same time. Okay, so if they're not synchronized, I could be altering the same value at the same time. What would that result, what would that lead to? Uh, improper balance. Uh, improper balance, how so? If you uh, are adding 100 to A, but then you mess up the synchronization, synchronization of B, you could effectively add random, like, no, $100 from nowhere to A. Okay, so if uh, transaction uh, one reads first, uh, reads the value, the old value of A, uh, transaction two simultaneously reads the old value of A. Let's get a uh, board. Let's start A off with uh, 1,000, B minus 1,000, um, and T1 and T2. T1 reads 100, uh, reads that A is 1,000. T2 reads uh, that A is 1,000 simultaneously, because maybe it's for immediately after. Now, uh, T1 uh, writes A uh, plus 100. 
times you get an A of 1,100. Simultaneously, B writes B has read that uh, A is 1,000, so it's going to write uh, A times 1.06. So now A is 1,060, and uh, $100 have mysteriously vanished. Oh. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, a good schedule might be one where we incorporate, uh, well, let's, let's look at a couple of other uh, errors. Uh, so a good schedule might be one where we perform each of these operations uh, kind of in sequence. So we transaction one uh, reads uh, reads A and updates it. Transaction two updates A. Transaction uh, two updates uh, one updates B. Transaction two updates B. But if we flip those two, we end up with kind of this this weird circumstance. Um, and this may seem a little uh, a, a little unintuitive because we haven't actually done anything incorrect here, anything uh, strictly incorrect. Um, but transaction two, um, if it had run entirely before transaction one, then the hundred, uh, the extra 60%, uh, sorry, the extra 6% would be reflected on neither account. Uh, if it's run uh, after the whole, uh, sorry, before it's reflected on the A uh, on A's account, it's run after it's reflected on B's account. It's actually uh, A A slip. Uh, so here we're going to update A. So if we'd run these transactions in isolation, we'd either get uh, we'd either get uh, A ending up with 1,160 uh, and B ending up with uh, the, uh, 954, or we'd end up with A uh, if the the um, percentage increase had, uh, happened afterwards. We'd end up with A being uh, 166 and B being uh, 960. Oh, sorry. Either end up with 166 and uh, 954, or we'd end up with 160 uh, and 960. And the difference is important because here we basically cost the bank uh, $6. $6 isn't much, but added up a lot uh, over over multiple instances, great. So this type of interleaving uh, is bad. Let's take a step back from, from this operation uh, and look at it from the databases perspective. So recall that um, we're going to look at transactions as a series of reads and writes followed by a commit. So from the, the databases perspective, it's looking at this as a sequence of reads and writes. Uh, transaction one reads A, then writes A. Transaction two reads A, then writes A. Transaction uh, two reads B, writes B. And then transaction one reads B and writes B. So this isn't, this particular order of operations isn't good. But what, what went wrong? 
So T1 modified the file while T2 is still using it. Um, possible, uh, that's one way to think about it, but there's, uh, we look at this in the opposite order. So uh, the This turns out to be correct. So th this leads to a outcome that is equivalent uh, to me running transaction one first and then running transaction two. So why is this okay but that not okay? Yeah. Because transaction two modified D before transaction one leaves it. Because transaction two modified B before transaction one did. Um, okay. The modifications of B in transaction one that happened before all modifications of B in transaction two. Um, if we do transaction one and then transaction two, uh, then, uh, or sorry, if, uh, so the, your argument is that we, uh, transaction two modified, tra uh, modified B before transaction one got a chance to modify B. But, If what if I did something like this, where transaction two uh, uh, applies its its modification first and uh, to A, then uh, then to B. If I run this sequence of operations, what I'll end up with is uh, what I'll end up with is uh, a outcome that is equivalent to running transaction two first and then transaction one. Which, again, from the perspective of the transactions, if I run the, the operations that way, from the perspective of the, the transactions themselves, they're still the only ones in the system at any given point in time. So this, I'd claim, is also okay. So why is this okay? Why is the other case okay, but this not okay? Okay, so there's some sort of weird ordering. Transaction two makes some changes in an order that is inconsistent with, with transaction one. Um, okay, let's, um, let's dive into that a little more. So, transaction two finishes before transaction one uh, finishes, but it also starts after transaction one starts. Re Let me pivot that a little bit and, and say that there are two ways that I claimed were correct. There is the case where transaction one runs entirely first, and then transaction two does what it needs to do. And there is the case where transaction two does everything it needs to first, and then transaction one goes. So we have this idea of uh, something being completely correct if I executed the entire transaction in isolation uh, before any other transaction happened. And the weird thing about this kind of middle case is that I executed, in effect, part of transaction one before transaction two, and part of transaction one after transaction two. And from the, the outside world, that, act, that ordering actually became uh, visible. So we're going to, uh, we're going to create an abstraction around this idea that allows us to reason about this type of ordering. 
So I'm going to define three high-level terms, uh, a schedule, a serial schedule, and a serializable schedule. So a schedule is just some ordering of read and write operations. Read A, write A, read A, write A, read A, write A, uh, sorry, read B, write B, read B, write B. And a serial schedule is an ordering of reads and writes where there is no interleaving whatsoever. So this is not a serial schedule. That's a serial schedule. So re-emphasize a serial schedule. There's no interleaving whatsoever. You run one transaction in its entirety and another transaction uh, in its entirety. Of course, that's horribly inefficient in general uh, because it means we have to execute all the transactions one at a time. So we're going to define a couple of notions of what's called serializability. Um, and a serializable schedule is one that is guaranteed to produce equivalent output to a serial schedule, some serial schedule. Questions? Um, so once again, serial schedule, and uh, we'd like to find uh, a serializable schedule that is guaranteed to produce equivalent, uh, an output that is equivalent to, uh, to a serial schedule. Just like we wanted to find a query that was more efficient that could produce output that was equivalent to the initial query, we want to find a schedule that is more efficient but equivalent or produces equivalent results. Okay, so we have in the extreme, uh, you can come up with a million different definitions for, uh, for schedules that are serializable, um, but finding a schedule that is equivalent in general is, is Turing complete. Um, if you can't actually figure out whether two schedules are equivalent unless you actually run both, and that defeats the purpose. So we're going to come up with a couple of simplifications, uh, a couple of, uh, of simplified notions of serializability that imply serializability but aren't necessarily guaranteed to cover all of the cases. In other words, uh, we're going to be able to tell you this particular schedule is serializable, uh, but we can't, uh, we can't um, definitively say that a schedule is not serializable. And the first of these is what's known as conflict equivalence. So um, the idea is basically to look at the ordering of events. So let's say I were to draw some lines here. So every, every time I saw transaction one doing an operation on a variable, an operation, and transaction two doing an operation on a variable, I, I connect those lines. And immediately you see something uh, weird because transaction one has an operation on A before transaction two. Transaction two has an operation on B before transaction one. So intuitively, conflict equivalence is basically you look at the order of operations on all of the variables, uh, and you want to make sure that all of those operations happen in exactly the same order. So two schedules, we're going to call them conflict equivalent if all of the conflicts, all of the operations where, where, uh, that happen on the same set of variables occur in the same order. 
So let's say I have another operation here, C. That schedule is conflict equivalent to to flipping the order of the B and the C operation on A uh, in, in transaction one. Because the conflicts, the B here still occurs before the B here. The A here still occurs before the A here. So we're allowed to reorder the schedule in any way as long as we don't flip the order of two conflicts. And we're going to say that two schedules are, that, excuse me, that a schedule is conflict serializable if it's equivalent to some serial schedule. So, for example, this schedule is not conflict serializable because there's no serializable schedule where, sorry, there's no serial schedule where A occurs first in T1, second in, in T2, and B occurs first in T1 and second in uh, B2. In fact, there are two serial schedules. There's A, B, B, oh, sorry, A, B, and A, B, A, B. So, um, to recap, a uh, conflict serializable schedule uh, starts with the premise that serial schedules are always correct. It allows you to reorder the schedule as long as you don't flip any orderings. And any schedule that is conflict equivalent to one of these serial schedules uh, is also correct and what we're going to call conflict serializable. Questions? Yeah. There's still the issue that if you run T2 before T1, you're getting a different answer. Uh, there's still the issue that if you run T2 before T1 uh, as opposed to T1 before T2, uh, you will get different answers. Correct. Um, and at some point, we're going to have to accept that. Um, so there is some, we want to be able to define some level of granularity on one, uh, one localized operation that we can reorder. Um, in this case, a transaction actually involved uh, the, the, um, the tr uh, bank account transfer operation has two specific uh, components that need to be, that are semantically linked. Uh, the money has to be removed from one account and placed into another. Um, the uh, interest accumulation uh, operation, again, has two independent operations that need to be linked. Um, because if you have, uh, if you, um, if you uh, apply the interest before doing the account transfer, it's possible that the bank could either lose money or uh, essentially gain more money than it should be gaining. Um, so semantically, we basically said T1 is one unit of, of computation, T2 is one unit of computation. Process them in whichever order you like as long, or process them in the order they arrive or whichever order is uh, most efficient. Uh, if they arrive at the same time, but it doesn't actually, from a correctness standpoint, what we care about is that T1 occurs in its entirety before T, uh, sorry, T1 in, occurs in its entirety uh, independent of T2. Does that kind of address your question? We have, uh, so we can enforce uh, correctness across transactions by uh, essentially, uh, so 
yes, um, there will be different outcomes if T1 and T2 occur independently. But what we're trying to prove, uh, at some level, if two people are trying to modify the database at the same time, two queries arrive exactly at the same time, you're going to have to pick arbitrarily between them to, to figure out which to do first. Um, and we're providing a, a semantic construct that allows users to have some control over the order in which these operations occur. If you really need to enforce that T1 uh, happens before T2, you either make them part of the same transaction or you wait until T1 finishes before starting T2. Right, you could create like a meta transaction layer to enforce ordering here. The, the fundamental problem is how do you make sure that the, that the operations here occur in isolation, and the operations here occur in isolation. Does that? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the only confusing part was that like, you're showing the race condition, but like you're trying, like you're saying that to ignore kind of the race condition, which one arrives first? Well, so there are two different race conditions here. Yeah. So there's the race condition on the transaction level, and the race condition on the operation level. So here we have a race condition uh, at the level of operations. You're saying that to just ignore the, like, as they arrive, but we should handle the ones that, like, cause uh, the condition level, right? Um, I mean, yeah. So the, the idea is you want to provide some sort of, uh, some sort of um, block of code. Let's call it a, 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 uh, what's the term in, in um, you want to take a batch of operations and basically say this needs to happen as one operation atomically. If you want more complex primitives, you can build them on top of that primitive. But without that one primitive, without the ability to take multiple operations and group them into one logical batch, you're uh, you're out of you can't do anything else. Uh, so we're, we're kind of building this one core primitive that you can use to build more, more complex, interesting ideas. Uh, think of this kind of like uh, a, uh, not a mutex, um, yeah, basically think of this as kind of a, a safe region. Um, yeah, it's been critical. critical region, thank you. Uh, think of this basically as a, crit uh, a transaction is basically a critical region. Does that, yeah, if you have two critical regions, it doesn't matter how, how you order the critical regions with respect to one another. What you care about is that one critical region. Does that make sense? And does that clarify your point? What is the schedule in terms of the software behind it? In uh, what is the schedule in terms of the software behind it? I'm not sure I follow. I just. We haven't really talked much about implementation for a lot of things, and I don't know exactly like, what we're discussing here in terms of how we implement it in a database. Ah, how would this be implemented in a database? So the API that you would basic that the database would basically give uh, a higher level is reads and writes. Um, I've got variables here. These variables essentially would correspond to rows in the database, um, or cells in the database, depending on uh, what you, uh, ha how exactly the, uh, some databases use some way. So essentially, based on whatever language we're using to implement calls on the database, we have to set up mutexes or locks. To so, that, so that's the point. Rather than using a mutex or a lock explicitly, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about, um, so we're, Right now, I'm talking about this kind of in the abstract, just to give, uh, to precisely define what we mean by cor uh, correct execution model. Uh, we'll talk about how those, uh, how you can actually encode one of these models, uh, like for example, conflict serializability. You can easily enforce using locks. Uh, we'll talk about how that happens once we, once we make precise what semantics we're trying to achieve. So, I mean, a critical region, 
the basic, the most simple way that you can enforce a critical region is to make sure that uh, the two, uh, that you're never in uh, one critical region at the same time as another. But at least in, in our case, transactions can be fairly slow. Um, so you actually do want to allow some level of overlap between the critical sections. Uh, what we'd like to be able to, to precisely define is how much overlap and when are we allowed to, uh, to uh, overlap two different critical regions so that we can define kind of an underlying implementation that actually satisfies these properties that we're defining. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, we will get into the implementation. I, I, in general, before you do any implementation, make sure you know the specification for what you're trying to implement, and so that's what we're going for. Essentially, we're learning the rules of what you should file when implementing, but it seems yes. like each case is going to be very unique. Just uh, follow these rules. Well, so, like I said, um, if we can prove that some sort of implementation follows conflict serializability, then it's we have some notion that that implementation is correct. Um, and basically, if we can prove that any time you have, uh, let's say you're using blocking, trivial case, uh, if every time I start a transaction, I take a lock on the, uh, on the entire database, um, I can be absolutely certain that, that, um, that uh, I'm going to get serializable behavior because I'm only doing one thing at a time. If I take locks out on the individual objects, again, I can have some property, I, I can have some ordering guarantees about what's happening. And I want to make sure that when I, I come up with a schedule, it is serializable. Or at least uh, some weaker form of serializability, like conflict serializability. Um, Uh, but before I get to that, uh, conflict serializability is actually a little bit overeager uh, because we're kind of looking at every operation on a variable as being the same. But in practice, in practice, this is actually a read and a write. This is actually a read and a write. And there are actually some cases where it does not actually matter um, the order. So I've got an example up on the projector. Um, now, if I was to, uh, let's say, do a, a simple bit of reordering, let's say, have transaction two do its right before transaction one, is this correct? Is the output going to be correct? Does it depend on the transaction? Okay, so there is some notion of, of correctness. Now, uh, the nice thing about conflict equivalence, at least, is that it works for any transaction. If all of my writes to A happen before, uh, if all of the operations on, on A and B happen first for transaction one, that's great. Um, because it doesn't matter what, what the transaction is, all of them are going to happen in the same serializable order. Now, what I just did here um, violates that. Um, I've flipped the order of two, uh, two operations on A, two write operations on A. So in practice, I've actually violated conflict equivalence here. These, this, ske oh, oops. this schedule and this schedule are not conflict equivalent because I changed the order of the rights on A. But are they going to produce equivalent outputs? Why? Yeah. So T3 performs a write on A, means T2 
completely irrelevant what T2 did because T3, uh, T3 just uh, overwrote everything that it did. Um, the order in which those two writes occur uh, just does not matter. So uh, looking at this from uh, an information flow perspective, you've got some uh, transaction and you've got some old state uh, and then some new state of the world that emerges from that transaction. Um, there are some read operations that uh, come out of that transaction. Um, and if you've got multiple transactions chained together, each of those is going to produce a new state that the next transaction in the chain uh, reads from. And eventually you get to the very end uh, and uh, you get some final state. Each of the transactions is going to produce some visible outputs, the reads, uh, and it's going to produce state that the next um, the next operation in the chain reads from. So these individual reads are important and the final state in some respect is also important. Um, what, the user, what comes out of the database should be consistent or should have some sort of uh, consistency. But we don't care about these kind of intermediate states. If, if data comes out of transaction one, goes into transaction two, transaction two uh, does something with it, then transaction three completely hides, uh, hides the effect of what transaction one, transaction two did, um, then it doesn't matter. Uh, in other words, we can take a look, uh, we can treat these uh, three, we can treat these transactions as just one big sequence of, of transformations. And what we want to make sure of is that the things that get read out are the things that are consistent. So looking at the, the data flow uh, allows us to define uh, another notion of, of equivalence called view equivalence. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to call two transactions equivalent, or sorry, we're going to uh, treat a batch of transactions, uh, operations in a, a batch of transactions uh, as uh, going to treat a schedule for a batch of transactions as being equivalent to another schedule um, if we can, if the reads are consistent and the final writes are consistent. Um, and this allows us to define uh, view serializability. View serializability as being any schedule that is view equivalent um, to a serial schedule. I'm bringing this up, even though it seems a little bit weird, because most relational database engines actually take this approach uh, to, to correctness. Um, and it leads to some weird corner cases, because some writes will just get arbitrarily executed out of order. And in some cases, you might actually be able to see a database state that should not, uh, in all practical uh, sense, uh, exist. Right. Right. So. So we've defined a couple of different uh, notions of serializability. And we'd like to, to get a sense of, so now we'd like to actually be able to, to implement uh, these serializable uh, mechanisms in, uh, we, we'd like to be able to uh, implement, uh, come up with an implementation for, for these uh, serializability uh, rules. So, what we're going to look at is uh, ways of using locking to enforce uh, serializability. We're going to look at um, oops, skip this. Right. Time. Yeah. All right. Let's go directly here. <clears throat> 
So, I mean, ultimately, what we'd like to do is, uh, is come up with some sort of implementation that ensures that uh, a the the schedules that we get out of that um, out of that implementation uh, are conflict free. That they're uh, either conflict uh, serializable or view serializable or um, serializable in general. Um, so we're going to look at two general approaches uh, to serializability. Um, one which is called optimistic current concurrency control and one which is called conservative uh, concurrency control. So each of these uh, approaches is going to take a slightly different uh, mentality in how to uh, prevent conflict. Uh, in the case of optimistic concurrency control, we're going to try and avoid conflicts uh, after the fact. Uh, so we're going to allow people to do whatever they want, but before we actually allow their transaction to commit, we're going to uh, do a quick validation and make sure that, they're, uh, that they didn't do anything wrong. And if we detect a, a, a conflict, uh, that a conflict has occurred, then we're essentially going to abort the transaction and restart it. In the case of conservative, uh, conservative con uh, concurrency control, we're going to basically do the reverse. We're not going to allow conflicts to occur in the first place, uh, basically by using locking. We're going to start uh, with uh, conservative uh, concurrency control. And the idea here is to be able to detect potential bad schedules even before uh, they, uh, they occur. Now this is going to introduce some, some uh, problems, uh, potential bugs. We're going to look at how, uh, how those bugs can be uh, avoided. So to start this off, uh, like I said, our, our overall approach is going to be basically based on locks and locking. And we're going to try and avoid, uh, we're going to as soon as you're using locks, there's now the possibility that you might end up with uh, a deadlock between transactions. So we're going to kind of look at ways to detect deadlock, and we're going to look at more fine-grained ways uh, to perform locking. But before we get to that, uh, kind of the, the high-level bit um, is that we're going to use uh, a, a simplified form of locking called two-phase locking. Um, so the idea behind two-phase locking is uh, to make your uh, make the uh, the locking product. Yeah. The idea behind two-phase locking is to make sure that uh, you don't enter a uh, to avoid kind of the common cases of uh, deadlocks. Um, to be precise. Uh, Two-phase locking basically allows you to uh, well, goes through two phases. In the first phase, you're going to acquire locks. Uh, in the second phase, you release the locks. But once you've released your first lock, uh, you're not allowed to uh, acquire any further locks. Why is this uh, an approach that you might want to take? Thoughts? Yeah. Ensure serializability. Ensure serializability. How? So if you have a lock, you're guaranteed that no one else has a lock unless you do your operations without like worrying that someone else is doing things. Okay. So once all of your uh, once you've gotten the lock, you can be sure that no one else is going to be modifying that particular record or whatever you have the lock on. Um, why is so? But why break it up into two phases? So you could do like some static one phase has priority, so you could have like lower priority people go first, and then have like an admin be the very last person who gets to uh, read it and write. Okay, so some sort of prioritization. Can you? Um, so then, like, how does that tie to the order in which I? Like, so if you're like the admin, and you know you're going last, and you don't have to worry about some other user writing after you, so you get like the final set. At least for that manage. Okay, so you might have some sort of prioritization that allows you to 
um, enforce a certain ordering that gives some transactions the final say. Okay. Um, but then when uh, when would the transactions uh, start releasing their locks? Why? Uh, at, yeah. It's kind of like the recursive model where you require, 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 and then you release, release, release. That way you guarantee a pair of a lock and a release. Uh, that way you don't double lock something. Okay, so you're you're uh, you're guaranteed never to, to double lock. So I'll I'll uh, get at this. So even if I'm really careful um, and make sure that all of my acquires are paired with releases, do a read on A, uh, and then I do a write on B, and then I've got another transaction here that does a read uh, on A and then write on B. And these two schedules are not conflict serializable, right? Because I've got conflict there. Well, read and read doesn't actually form a conflict. Uh, let's see, I've got a write. And I got a conflict. Now, let's say that I wanted to be really, really uh, optimistic about my locking. And I, I, I want to make sure that my locks occur, that, that I use my locks uh, as efficiently as possible and keep things locked as little as, uh, as little as possible. So I take a lock out on A, I take a lock out on B. But oh wait, uh, I'm, I'm done here. I, I don't actually, uh, I don't need to keep the lock on A anymore. So I unlock A, unlock B. Have I actually protected myself from anything here? No. Um, by doing all of the unlocks at some point, I'm making sure that I do all of my unlocks in one batch, or I have kind of this, this separation point where I stop being able to take new locks out. What I'm essentially saying is that once I start releasing locks, I'm never going to be able to uh, take a new lock out. and that means that I'm not going to be accessing new resources. I've assumed, by, by this point, I have seen all of the res I've acquired locks for all of the resources that I will ever try and acquire. Which means that there's no chance of another transaction sneakily coming in and acquiring some locks in the middle that I shouldn't have released yet. Essentially, basically saying, if it's safe, if, if another transaction can come in and take a lock at this point, it's safe for those two transactions to be interleaved. And that holds for any point after this because all I can do is release locks. Okay. Um, we'll go into a bit more depth on this. Go into a little bit more depth on this in a little bit, uh, in next lecture. Um, but I want to recap uh, something that hopefully most of you have already encountered. And that's the idea that that's the idea that there are different classes of operations. So 
that a serializable schedule in general? Is that a serializable schedule? Guaranteed to be a serializable schedule. Yeah, why? Nodding your head. Well, so what's what's the output here? What's the, the final? What's changed in the world? So I have some state uh, initial. I have some state afterwards. How are those two states different? Yeah. The value of the is changed. Okay, so this is. State zero plus some change to B. And that change came from transaction one. The order of operations here is different, but that's okay because these operations don't actually change the state of the world. On the other hand, let's say transaction two also has a right to A. Here, we have another conflict that's out of order. This read happens before this write, this write happens before that write. What's the final state of the world here? Yeah, the change to A. It's also going to have the change to A. And this is going to be the effect of transaction 1. This is going to be the effect of transaction 2. Transaction 2's update to B is going to be hidden. So ultimately, what I'm getting at here is that conflict equivalence, um, conflict equivalence um, can be simplified a little bit. And two schedules that have a conflict on read operations don't necessarily have a conflict in general. The, the order of read operations uh, doesn't matter. Uh, order of read relative to write matters. Order of write relative to write matters. But order of read relative to read doesn't matter. We can actually uh, make that uh, manifest in our, uh, sorry? It was a question? Uh, you just asked me why transaction one would be canceled out, but that's just because the rights of E. Oh, sorry, the, the transaction one should be canceled out. It is. Uh, uh, so what you end up with with that schedule is transaction one, uh, transaction one's effect on B and transaction two's effect on, uh, on A. What you'd like to see is. Um, like to see basically a schedule where uh, a schedule where T1 reads from T2's A. So either This is correct. This is also correct. But here, we've essentially flipped the order of uh, either the read on A and the write on A, or the, write on, the two writes on B. So this is not correct. Yeah? Does that make the assumption that somewhere in transaction one we need to read A to affect B later on? Because if you're just reading A and not doing with 
is actually one. Ah, okay. So one if uh, so, this is making the assumption that uh, that there's a causal ordering um, between the operations within the transaction. You're completely right. Um, what we're trying to do, though, is generate a set of semantics that are correct for any transaction. Um, if we treat the transaction as a black box, and again, uh, recall at the start, uh, I, was gonna, I was describing kind of a, a simplified model where essentially the transaction gets a bunch of reads as input and a bunch of, produces a bunch of writes as output. Um, if we're trying to reason about that specific model, then we can't, uh, we can't throw out the possibility that B depends on A. Essentially, any, any write operation that comes after read operation could possibly depend on it. Uh, there's uh, more intricate transaction models that actually allow you to uh, kind of look at the data flow within the transaction and try and optimize, uh, it, optimize that there. Um, initially, we're not looking at, at those, but yes, you're completely right that you could, uh, you could make this more intricate and, and get a more reliable, more robust uh, schedule equivalent, notion of schedule equivalence. Does that address your question? Thank you. All right, um, so we're running out of time. So I'm simply going to say that uh, what we're going to talk about next class is the idea that you can have different types of locks. Um, you probably already encountered the idea of reader-writer locks. Uh, we're also going to talk about hierarchical locks.